A few hours after the ceremony, the Tibetans try one by one to find out more about the oracle's predictions. Where are you from? Lhasa. And my family is still there. That's why I want to know if I'll see them again one day. I can't tell you all. You know it's a secret, but it all goes well. The oracle says the Tibetan government in exile will soon take important decisions. I believe him. Every day when I pray in front of him that I have a, some special feeling and something like special power he gives to me and I feel like that he always encourages me whenever I pray him. After I finish prayer him and then in my heart I have a full belief and then I feel more happy after I pray for him. In Dharamsala, it is difficult to gauge what the Tibetan parliament in exile thinks of the oracle's predictions. Do you believe in the predictions of the oracle? Questions are unwelcome. Here, the spiritual authority is not questioned. Ah, yes, yes, yes. I'm... Monk. <laughs> <laughs> the parliamentary spokesperson finally answers our question. The concept of protecting deities is to help you in achieving things where humans are not able to under certain circumstances. We cannot decide. So then we'll ask him, you know, in which way we should go. So he'll ask us, give us the guidelines, the two guidelines, the right way. Mm, the right way? Yeah, we are, we are very, very sure about what he says. We believe it. Are you very sure? Sure, sure, sure. sure. To be a Buddhist is, above all, to think positively and to refuse war as a means to saving Tibet. But for some time now, the impatience and anger of the younger generations has been gaining ground in the community. These Tibetan youth are ready to take up arms. Their leader is Lashang Sering, often referred to as the devil. Why is there a state oracle of Tibet if the Tibetan parliament and the Tibetan Kashak are not consulting? My problem is that when national leaders whose duty it is to make decisions and to be responsible and answerable for those decisions are then using the system of oracles. There is a price for freedom. And the price for freedom is not paid in silver and gold. It is paid in the currency of life and blood. These young teenagers have just reached Dharamsala. They are welcomed by Sering Chenga, another of the Dalai Lama's state oracles. Sering does not believe in war. Faced with this delicate situation, she tries to calm the hot-headed youth. <laughs> Yes, we managed to escape from the Chinese. We were afraid, but at least they did not catch us. We climbed the mountains in the snow. It was very cold during weeks and weeks. These children don't know how to speak properly. They are yak farmers. The Chinese are saying that they educate Tibetans, but this proves the contrary. All these young people are not educated. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I don't know how to talk. You know, we just arrived at the refugee center. At the refugee center, there are different types of people. Become friends with cheerful and positive children. Get close to radiant people. This is the future of humanity. I'm not going to talk about my trances. No, I'm going to talk about essential matters, what humanity needs to hear to evolve. The 21st century looks like a very modern century from the outside, but times are serious. Our hearts are suffering from the inside, and we've reached the limits. We're killing each other. We must give light to ignorance and regain consciousness. Let's help and love our enemies. 
That's how we will save Tibet and all humanity. So how will Tibetan culture be saved? The urgency of the situation has brought together the greatest experts of the science of the mind for an historic conference. After a week of initiation, the keepers of the secret teachings of the Buddha have decided to translate the complete texts of the Buddha in the next 25 years. Robert Thurman, a very close friend of the Dalai Lama for the last 45 years and one of the world's most influential specialists on Tibetan Buddhism. This visionary, who is a confidant to the spiritual chief, is in agreement with the oracles. I have this other vision. It's the Dalai Lama's own vision. He and whichever president of China will go hand in hand to the United Nations. And in the United Nations, they will declare, and they'll bring Al Gore there, and they will declare that the whole of the Tibetan Plateau is a global peace park, an environmental preserve, a nature preserve. And they will restore the headwaters of all the rivers of Asia. These oracles from the roof of the world agree and predict a radiant future for Tibet and a return of the saintly Dalai Lama to his palace at Lhasa. Well, one of the reporters behind this fascinating story is with us from New Delhi via satellite. Hello, Capucine Henri, and welcome to the show. At the beginning of your report, we see the prophecies of a six-year-old girl who says Tibet will be free in 2012. Why this date? It's true, we have to be very cautious when we're talking about this date, 2012, because it's prophecies and predictions, and obviously it's not science. But it's true that the date, 21st of December in 2012, these are dates that even the oldest uh, civilizations have been looking at this, the Mayan civilization, the Egyptians, and uh, the Indians. So uh, current uh, astronomers consider that the 21st of December, 2012, the sun will rise, and will be aligned with the galactic center which emits the most cosmic radiation. So from that point on, the sun's activity on the earth will be more powerful than ever in the past. So mystics talk about returning to the light. The great civilizations talk about going into the uh, uh, age of Aquarius. And the Tibetans don't really talk about 2012 specifically, but they talk about moving into a new form of consciousness. Oracles, uh, the, the Dalai Lama as oracles say that we won't be able to live other than being in total harmony with the forces of the light, otherwise we could even die. Uh, Kepi said it seems unlikely that Tibet will be freed of China's rule following a political settlement considering that ongoing negotiation between the Tibetan government in exile and the Chinese authorities have reached a complete deadlock. So how will it happen? How, how, how will Tibet become free in uh, 2012? It's true that the negotiations between the Tibetan government and the Chinese government are at a standstill. The Dalai Lama, though, has come to a point where he considers that negotiating with the Chinese leaders is in vain, is futile. So he's trying to set up a new strategy, in fact, where he's trying to work directly with the Chinese people and reach the hearts of the Chinese people. So the strategy, he's trying to set up the strategy, trying to implement it, because he considers that the Chinese people, the 1.3 billion uh, inhabitants that really hold the power in China, are capable of uh, pushing the Tibetan cause forward. Okay, very quickly, uh, Capucin, in closing, how will the Dalai Lama manage uh, to convince the Chinese people rather than the Chinese authorities? Well, the Dalai Lama is increasingly getting positioned as the spiritual leader of Tibet. Remember, he's uh, semi-retired politically. He's working with a lot uh, more intellectuals, inviting them in from China uh, to Dharamsala. Uh, he's working uh, with the Chinese and Tibetan. He's created the uh, Association for Chinese and Tibetan Friends and three radio stations where you have reporters and journalists, Tibetan people communicating with the outside world. And the ultimate strategy uh, that the Dalai Lama is planning on using, he considers that Taiwan could perhaps be a player or, or a bridge between China and Tibet. Maybe the entry of, uh, into Tibetan culture in China. 
Well, Capucine, thank you very much for being uh, from New Delhi with us today. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Unfortunately, do join us again next week for another edition of uh, Reporters. Goodbye.